You've spoken honestly about the possibility of war between U.S. and China in the long term, if no diplomatic solution is found. For example, on the question of Taiwan and one China policy. Right. How do we avoid the trajectory where these two superpowers clash? Well, it's it's worth reading that book on the the uh, difficult to pronounce Thucydides trap, I believe it's called. I love war history. I like inside out and backwards. Um, there's hardly a battle I haven't read read about. And and trying to figure out like what what really was the cause of victory in any particular case, as mm -hmm. opposed to what one side or another claimed was the, the reason. Both the victory and what sparked the war. And yeah, yeah, the whole thing. Yeah. So that Athens and Sparta is a classic case. The thing about the Greeks is they really wrote down a lot of stuff. They loved writing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are lots of interesting things that happened in many parts of the world, but they just, people just didn't write it down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we don't know what happened, or they didn't really write with in detail. They just mm -hmm. would say like, "We went, we had a battle, and we won." And like, well, what? Can you add a bit more? Um, <laughs> the, the, the Greeks they really wrote a lot. <laughs> They were very articulate on, they just love writing. So, mm -hmm. and we have a bunch of that writing that's preserved. So we know what led up to the uh, Peloponnesian War between um, the Spartan and Athenian alliance. Um, and uh, we, we know that they, they, for quite, they, they saw it coming. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Spartans didn't write, they, they also weren't very verbose by their nature, but they did write, but they weren't very verbose. <laughs> yeah, they were terse. Uh, but the, the, Athenians and the other Greeks wrote, wrote a line. And they were like, um, and Sp Sparta was really kind of like the leader of, of Greece. Um, but, but Athens grew stronger and stronger with each passing year. And, um, and everyone's like, well, that's inevitable that there's gonna be a clash between Athens and Sparta. Uh, well, how do we avoid that? And they couldn't, they couldn't, they actually, they saw it coming and they still could not avoid it. <laughs> so, you know, at some point, if there's, if, if one uh, group, one civilization or, or country or whatever um, exceeds another, sort of like if, you know, the United States has been the biggest kid on the block for, since I think around 1890 uh, from an economic standpoint. So the United States has been the economic, most powerful economic engine in the world longer than anyone's been alive. Um, and the foundation of war is economics. So now we have a situation in the case of China where the, um, the economy is likely to be two, perhaps three times larger than that of the US. So imagine you're the biggest kid on the block for as long as anyone can remember, and suddenly a kid comes along who's twice your size. So we see it coming. Yeah. How is it possible to stop? Is there some, let me throw something out there, just intermixing of cultures, understanding. There does seem to be a giant cultural gap in understanding of each other. And you're an interesting case study because you are an American, obviously mm -hmm. you've done a lot yes. of uh, incredible manufacture here in the United States, but you also work with China. I've spent a lot of time in China and met with the leadership many times. Maybe a good question to ask is, what are some things about China that people don't understand, positive, just in the culture? What's some interesting things that you've learned about the Chinese? Well, uh, the, the sheer number of really smart, hardworking people in China is um, incredible. Uh, there are, really, if you say like, how many smart, hardworking people are there in China? There's far more of them there than there are here, I think, in my, in my opinion. Um, the, uh, and they've got a lot of energy. So, I mean, the, the architecture in China that's in recent years is far more impressive than the US. I mean, in the, the, the train stations, the buildings, the high-speed rail, everything, it's um, really far more impressive than what we have in the US. I, I mean, I recommend somebody just go to Shanghai and Beijing, look at the buildings and go to, you know, take the train from Beijing to Xi'an, where you have the terracotta warriors. Um, China's got an incredible history, a uh, very long history. And, um, you know, I think arguably the, in terms of the use of language from, from a written standpoint, 
um, sort of one of one of the oldest, perhaps perhaps the oldest written language. And in China, people did write things down. So um, now China um, historically has always been, with rare exception, been internally focused. Um, they have not been acquisitive. Uh, they've they've fought each other. There have been many many civil wars. Mm -hmm. um, in the Three Kingdoms War, I believe they lost about seventy percent of their population. So and, and that does, so the they've had brutal internal wars, like civil wars that make the U.S. civil war look t small by comparison. Um, so it, I think it's important to appreciate that China is not uh, monolithic. Mm -hmm. um, we sort of think of like China as a sort of one entity of one mind, and this is definitely not the case. Um, from what I've seen, and I think most people who understand China would agree, that people in China think about China 10 times more than they think about anything outside of China. So it's like 90% of their consideration is uh, you know, our is, is is internal. Well, isn't that a really positive thing when you're talking about the collaboration and a future peace between superpowers? When you're inward facing, which is like focusing on improving yourself versus focusing on yeah, uh, quote unquote, improving others through military might. The good news: the history of China suggests that China is not acquisitive, meaning they're not going to go out and invade a whole bunch of countries. Mm -hmm. um, now, they do feel very strongly. You know, so that's that's good. I mean, because a lot of a lot of very powerful countries have been acquisitive. Mm -hmm. um, the, the U.S. is one of the also one of the rare cases that has not been acquisitive. Like in, after World War II, the U.S. could have basically taken over the world and any country. Like we got nukes, nobody else got nukes. We don't even have to lose soldiers. Uh, which country do you want? Mm -hmm. And the United States could have taken over everything. Oh, it at will, and it didn't. Um, and the United States actually helped rebuild countries. So it helped rebuild Europe, you know, helped rebuild Japan. Um, this is very unusual behavior, almost unprecedented. Um, you know, the U.S. did conspicuous acts of kindness, like the Berlin airlift. You know, um, and and I think, uh, you know, there's, it's always like, well, America's done bad things. Well, of course, America's done bad things, but one needs to look at the the whole track record. Um, and, and just generally, you know, one, one sort of test would be, how do you treat your prisoners of war? Mm -hmm. Or let's say, um, you know, no offense to the Russians, but let's say you're in Germany, it's 1945. You got the Russian army coming on one side and you got the French, British and American armies coming on the other side. Who would you like to be, to surrender to? Like no country is like morally perfect, but I recommend uh, being a POW with the Americans. That would be my choice very strongly. <laughs> in the full menu of POW. Very US. much so. <laughs> and in fact, one of our Brown um, yeah. took, you know, a small guy, uh, was like, we've got to be captured by the Americans. Yep. And uh, in, in fact, the, SS was under orders to execute Von Brown and all of the uh, German rocket engineers. Uh, and they narrowly escaped their SS. They, they, they said they were going out for a walk in the woods. They left in the middle of winter with no coats. Uh, and they ran like, and with no food, no coats, no water. And just ran like hell uh, and ran west. Um, and by sheer luck, they, I think his brother found like a, a bicycle or something. And, um, and then just cycled west as fast as he could and found, found a U.S. patrol. Um, so anyway, that's, that's, one, that's one way you can tell morality is, who, who, where do you want to be a POW? <laughs> it's, it's not fun anywhere, but some places are much worse than others. So um, anyway, so, so, so I think America has been, uh, while far from perfect, uh, generally a, a benevolent force. Um, and uh, we should always be self-critical and uh, we try to be better. Um, but um, anyone with half a brain knows that. So, so I think there are, in this way, China and uh, the United States are similar. Ne neither country has been acquisitive. Um, 
in, in a significant way. So that's like a, you know, a, a shared principle, I guess. Um, now, now China does feel very strongly about Taiwan. They've been very clear about that for a long time. Um, you know, from their standpoint, it's, it's, it would be like one of the states is, is, is you know, n not there, like, like Hawaii or something like that, but, but more significant than Hawaii, you know. Um, and Hawaii is pretty significant for us. So um, they, they, they view it as, as, as really the, that there's a fundamental part of China, uh, the island of Formosa, now, now Taiwan, that is um, not part of China, but should be. Uh, and the only reason it, it hasn't been is because of the US Pacific fleet. And as their economic power grows, and as their military power grows, the thing that they are clearly saying uh, is their interest will, you know, clearly be materialized. Yes, China has been very clear that um, they will incorporate Taiwan uh, peacefully or uh, militarily, but that they will incorporate it from their standpoint is one hundred percent likely. You know, something you said about conspicuous acts of kindness as a geopolitical policy. It almost seems naive, but I'd venture to say that this is probably the path forward, how you avoid most wars. Just as you say it, mm -hmm. it sounds naive, but it's kind of brilliant. If you believe in the goodness of underlying most of human nature, it just seems like conspicuous acts of kindness can uh, reverberate through the populace of the countries involved. And, yeah. Well, and de-escalate. Absolutely. So for, in, in after World War 1, the the they made a big mistake. You know, they, they basically tried to lump all the blame on Germany. Um and um and and you know, settled Germany with uh impossible reparations. Um and you know, really, there was a lot of there was a fair, quite a bit of blame to um, go around for World War One, um, but they they try to you know put it all on Germany, um, and uh, that was that that laid the seeds for World War Two. Uh, so it's a lot of people, well, not just Hitler, a lot of people felt wronged, um, and they wanted vengeance. And they got it. People don't forget. Yeah. You you you, know, you kill somebody's father, or mother, or son, daughter. They're not going to forget it. They will want vengeance. Um, so after World War II, they're like, "Well, the Treaty of Versailles was a huge mistake um, in World War One." And um, so this time, instead of uh, you know crushing the losers. We're, we're actually going to help them with the Marshall Plan, and we're going to help rebuild, re rebuild uh, Germany. Um, we're going to help rebuild, uh, or you know, Austria and the the other, you know, Italy and whatnot. So, 